Oscar's crazy beats. Good evening. I'm Joni Taylor. I'm so happy to be here with you tonight as we have an engaging conversation about navigating race and culture in college athletics. And I say engaging because I want to encourage you to ask questions. We're going to be keeping account of all the questions and then once we get done with the formal part of the lecture, I'm happy to stay and answer any questions you guys have. So with that being said, let's go ahead and jump in and get started. So to cue this conversation about navigating race and culture, I want to show you a video. This video is what I would call a privilege walk video. Um, it has been out for about four or five years, maybe more. Some of you have probably already seen it. If you have, then it's a great opportunity to watch it again. If you've never seen it before, hopefully it leaves you feeling the way I feel every single time I watch it, which is enlightened, empowered, and a sense of camaraderie. So let's get started. Hey, line up. Line up, everybody line up. We're about to race. Everybody line up. Shoulder to shoulder, take off your backpacks. Basketball, line up, we're about to race. Hey, we are, we are racing for a $100 bill. The winner of this race will take this. It's a $100 bill. Before I say go, I'm going to make a couple statements. If those statements apply to you, I want you to take two steps forward. If those statements don't apply to you, I want you to stay right where you're at. Take two steps forward if both of your parents are still married. Take two steps forward if you grew up with a father figure in the home. Take two steps forward if you had access to a private education. Take two steps forward if you had access to a free tutor growing up. Take two steps forward if you've never had to worry about your cell phone being shut off. Take two steps forward if you've never had to help mom or dad with the bills. Take two steps forward if it wasn't because of your athletic ability, you don't have to pay for college. Take two steps forward if you never wondered where your next meal was going to come from. I want you guys up here in the front just to turn around and look. Every statement I've made has nothing to do with anything any of you have done. Has nothing to do with decisions you've made. Everything I have said has nothing to do with what you've done. We all know these people up here have a better opportunity to win this hundred dollars. Does that mean these people back here can't race? No. We would be foolish to not realize we've been given more opportunity. We don't want to recognize that we've been given a head start. But the reality is we have. Now, there's no excuse. They still got to run their race. You still got to run your race. But whoever wins this hundred dollars, I think it'd be extremely foolish of you not to utilize that and learn more about somebody else's story. 
Because the reality is, if this was a fair race and everybody was back on that line, I guarantee you some of these black dudes would smoke all of you. And it's only because you have this big of a head start that you're possibly going to win this race called life. That is a picture of life, ladies and gentlemen. Nothing you've done has put you in the lead that you're in right now. When I say go, on your mark, get set, go. If you didn't learn anything from this activity, you're a fool. What a powerful video. And I think it embodies everything we're gonna talk about when we need to navigate race and culture. But it starts with knowing the story of the person standing to the right and the left of you that you're going to go into battle with. So before we talk about how we learn those stories and how important it is to know the background of your teammates and of, of the people that you work with every day, I think it's important to put some numbers up. And so this is just revenue generating sports. What is a revenue generating sport? It is a sport that nets a positive revenue at the end of their season. So when you take expenses, travel, um, all the things that they have to pay out, they still bring in more to give you a positive net revenue. Those sports are football, men's basketball, and in some cases, women's basketball and baseball. So if you look at the numbers, as of January 2019, on average, football nets $31.9 million. So that is an average. You've got some football programs who bring in over $100 million, okay? Men's basketball's average is 8.1 million, and women's basketball averages around 1.8 million. An outlier in women's basketball at Stanford. Over the last three years, they've been averaged $18 million in revenue. So again, some women's basketball programs and baseball programs. I think it's important to know because there's also non-revenue generating sports. Those are sports that are not listed up here that at the end of their season, they're in the red. They're not in the black, which is every other collegiate sport. And there's so many deep dives you can go into um, percentages and numbers based on revenue generating sports and non-revenue generating sports. But for today's conversation, we're going to focus on these revenue generating sports. So now that you know what revenue, revenue generating sports are, and mostly the three teams that give you this profit, let's look at the numbers, okay? Football. There are 130 FBS, FBS means football bowl subdivision, head coaches. Of those 130, only 14 are black. However, black student athletes make up approximately 55% of college football players, while only 10% of those head coaches are black. There's one SEC head coach that's black, it's Derek Mason at Vanderbilt. There's one black head coach in the ACC, okay, Dino Babers at Syracuse. So again, if you look at the number of student athletes, um, there's a huge gap between the number of student athletes that are minorities versus being coached by minority coaches in the sport of football. Men's basketball, by the numbers, 51% of Division I men's basketball student athletes are black, and 73 identify as non-white minorities. A non-white minority is anybody who doesn't see themselves as white, biracial, Asian, Latino, any of those other ethnicities, okay? At the start of the 2019 season, there were only 10 black head coaches which makes up 13.8% in Autonomy 5 conferences. Now, what is Autonomy 5? I know I'm throwing a lot of basketball, call, NCAA college terms at you. Autonomy 5 just means it's the highest level of Division 1. And the conferences that make that up are the SEC, the ACC, the Pac-12, the Big 10, and the Big 12 conferences. Okay? So that's the Autonomy 5. Of all... 353 Division I men's basketball programs, that means every program around Division I, a little over 100 are coached by black males for 29%. So again, look at the percentage of student athletes that are minorities playing men's basketball, and then look at the percentage of black head coaches that are actually coaching the sport. Women's basketball by the numbers. 
there are 65 teams that are considered to be autonomy five program. Of those programs, only 10 are coached by black females, and six of those 10 are in one conference. I am happy to say that in the SEC, there are six black um, head coaches and 10 female head coaches in the SEC. Almost half of autonomy five women's basketball players are black and 76% identify as non-white minorities, but only 15% of those coaches are black in the Autonomy 5 program. Okay, of all 354 NCAA Division I women's basketball programs, which counts all levels of Division I, there's only 89 that are coached by either a black male or a black female. And I put that up there just to let you know what those numbers are. I think a lot of times there's a perception um, that student athletes in general are given a scholarship and they have this great opportunity and they need to take advantage of it. And all that is true. It's just like the video said. You still have a race to run, okay? There's no excuses. You still have to do what you're supposed to do. But I think sometimes we forget that in some of those cases we have uprooted a student athlete from a background that is different than the one they are in now and they're having to navigate the new environment they're in, compete, play at a high level while still dealing with all the things that happened at home. And in most cases, they're doing that with a coach who cannot relate to what they are going through because of the um, percentages and lack of represent representation there are in these three revenue generating sports that I just showed you. So with all of that being said, how do we get to navigating race and culture in sport? The beautiful thing about sports is that it is a great unifier. It is what brings us together. Um, you learn to become a family. You are fighting for each other, the person to the left, to the right of you that you're practicing with and you're in the trenches with every day. And it gives you an opportunity to be around people from a different background or who look different than you earlier than most people have the opportunity to do. And not just be around them, be in tough, stressful situations, okay? Um, when you're competing, when you're practicing, when you're having to go in the trenches with those people every single day, it, it brings you together in a way that a lot of things don't do. So sports is the great unifier. I also think, however, that sometimes um, sports protects our student athletes from some of the real world challenges, especially our black and non-white non student athletes because they get put on a pedestal or they get treated differently. And they think they're being treated that way because of who they are, when really they're being treated that way because they're a student athlete or they're an athlete at a university. And then, something happens that makes them realize, okay, I am a minority first. And a lot of things have happened over the summer that has brought that to light, and so that's what we'll you know, dive into. But how do you navigate it? It's building your foundation, okay? Whether you are on a team, in a corporation, running a business, running a program, running a college, you've gotta have a mission statement. And does that mission statement reflect all parties involved? Is it inclusive? Is it inviting? Um, does it consider everybody that's going to step foot into your program or touch or, or have a sense, a smell, a, a taste of what it is you guys are doing. And then what are your core values? These are things that we talk about for our program in the recruiting process before we ever bring our student athletes on campus. And it is definitely in our handbook. It is in our locker room. Um, I would hope that if you run into any of our young ladies, they would be able to tell you what our core values are, what the fundamentals of our program are, what it is we believe in. And then what is your overall theme? There's got to be like a, a thing that's got to be your over, overall theme. For our athletic department is if you see it, you own it. If you see it, you own it. For our women's basketball program, it's um, where ladies become legends. And that's our overriding theme. I think it's important that you have some staples, some go-to statements that everybody can go back to when we are reflecting or when we're thinking on, on times that <clears throat> bring up challenging moments. And then what is an annual thing that you can go to for this year that's going to impact um, performance, numbers, the motivation, your inspiration for a particular season or year? I think it's important to even get more detailed and peel the layers back to be able to have a catchphrase or a theme for a year. And that's your branding. That's where you put that on signage. You get bracelets. You do different things. You put it around the building so that when anybody walks into your space, they know exactly what your foundation is. They should be able to speak it. Anybody who touches your program, who is around your business, they should be able to speak it, know it. It should be something that is brought up all the time, not just when something happens. 
so that it has real value and a real purpose and it is um, something that everybody knows and it's not just pulled out of the drawer with the murder of George Floyd or Ahmaud Arbery or when certain things happen, the, the COVID crisis that we're in now. Once you've built that foundation, how do you invest in the people who are a part of the program, okay? How do you get to know them? How do you know the story of the person to the right or to the left of you? For us, we do it in, a, in a several ways. We always have a team retreat, okay? We're still trying to figure out this year how we're gonna manage that with COVID. I don't know the answer to that. But we have a team retreat, and during that team retreat, we do a lot of different activities. Sometimes we have a trust fall where we are outside and we have to, you guys have all had a trust fall where you have to literally put your life in, in your teammates' hands and trust that they're going to have your back in whatever that situation is. Sometimes it's being blindfolded and them having to lead you on a walk and get you from point A to point B to point C, um, and you giving up control and putting your control and your trust in your teammates' hands. On road trips, we are very intentional about how we partner up the roommates on the road. We want to make sure that they don't have the same roommate on the road that they have here on campus so they can continue to get to know someone outside of their circle maybe or someone who doesn't look like them and, and learn about them in a different way. We want to make sure we're bringing in speakers, okay, diverse speakers who can give them experiences, educate, inform, equip so that when they go out into the real world that they're prepared. And videos are a great way to do that as well as you just saw with our opening privilege walk. So any moment that we can use to teach, we want to do. And then that leads to a conversation. And, and usually those conversations lead to someone sharing an experience, even if it's us as coaches, sharing our experiences. And that's how we build that foundation and we learn how to invest in each other. We also try to do it at team meals. We'll, we'll just sit around. It's a more relaxed environment where people can open up and learn more day-to-day -day things that are going on. And then, obviously, during practice and competition, what better way to learn how to invest in each other when you have to line up and compete and, and fight every single day in a practice environment? <clears throat> and then I just call this heart-to-hearts. And this is really the meat of what we're going to talk about is navigating difficult conversations and moments. You cannot do that unless you've had a foundation that's been built and unless you've learned how to invest in each other, okay? Once you've done that and there's real relationships, then you can have any conversation you want to have. It might be uncomfortable. It might be difficult. But you can have the conversation because you've already done your work. You've already done your homework. And so I may not get it right. You may not get it right. I may not say it exactly the way it needs to be said. But because you know my heart, and I know your heart, then we're gonna be able to come together on the fact that we're a family, I have your best intentions at heart, okay, and this is what I'm trying to get to at the core of this conversation. So, you know, I get asked all the time, what, what did you guys do during the time of, of, of quarantine? What conversation did you have with your team? And the same conversation we always have, okay? Let's seek to understand before we're understood. Let's lead with grace and humility during these times. Okay, let's look outwardly and not inwardly. And let's say, instead of, instead of saying this is happening to me, let's say this is happening for me and how are we going to be better when we come out of this situation? How are we gonna be better? And what can we do for somebody else? I get asked all the time, what did you do with your team after the murder of George Floyd? I did what we always do. We jumped on a Zoom call. I checked in to make sure everybody was good. Our entire staff checked in to make sure everybody was good. And then we had the same conversations. Let's seek to understand, okay, before trying to be understood. Let's take off my glasses and give them to you so you can see things from my perspective. Now, give me your glasses and let me put them on so I can see things from your perspective. Let's sit down and have a conversation with somebody who is different than us and truly understand where they're coming from. Let's be flexible. Let's lead with grace and humility and empathy and understand that while we all may not agree, I don't know how we're gonna get 25, 30 people to all be clones of each other. That's not what we're trying to do. We're trying to educate and empower and equip you to have a voice and to use that voice to make positive change in the world. And that may look different for everybody. Everybody's platform is not the same. But we can sit down and have those difficult conversations because we laid the groundwork when they came. We laid the groundwork six months ago. We laid the groundwork, in some cases, 
two or three years ago with our seniors. And so it makes it not easy, okay? But in some ways easy. It makes it easy to sit down and have a hard conversation that may give us that little feeling inside that you get sometimes when you're nervous, when you have the adrenaline, I don't really know how this is gonna go. Sometimes uncomfortable conversations take you there. But we have always walked away from those conversations with a level of love, of deep respect, and being able to move forward and have another understanding and a different perspective of what someone else is going through. And then it's important to make sure you have a pulse on the people on your team, your program, your company, whatever organization you're a part of. Do you have a pulse on each one of your team members? You know, our staff does a great job of being connected with our players. I think that's one of the things we do best in terms of relationships. Um, social media is a great way to find out what our student athletes are thinking because they post everything. But it, are they going through something that we need to address? You know, our, our young ladies do a really good job of saying, hey, you might want to check on so-and-so today. She just seems down. She seems quiet in the locker room. I don't quite know what's going on, but you might want to check on her. It's important to have a pulse on your team, your organization, your company, so that you know how to engage, you know how to make sure that you bring the right people in to address situations if they need to be addressed. You know when to step back and tear up the practice plan that you thought you had planned or whatever you were gonna do in that meeting and pivot and do something else instead um, and be fluid in those situations and that's so very important because what you don't wanna do is be disconnected because that's when it leads to something greater in the end. It, you know, they say you turn a, 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 mountain, a, a mountain into a molehill, a molehill into a mountain, whatever that saying is. That's what you don't want to happen. And that's what happens when people don't have a pulse on their team and they don't know what's going on. Something that starts out really small turns into something really, really big. And I think it's important to put their voice in the room. I shouldn't be the one doing all the talking all the time. And we are constantly encouraging our young ladies to talk more to share more. But it's important for them to feel like they want to be heard, especially this generation. They have a voice, and they're going to use their voice one way or another. So it's important that you're giving them a space to do that, but also educating them on the consequence of using their voice if they want to use it, what comes with that, and making sure that they're prepared. Um, and I think also using their voice gives them a chance to think about what they want to do. It was really important for us, after the murder of George Floyd, Rashad Brooks, Breonna Taylor, all the things that we saw happening and that are still happening, that they had a call to action. You know, we talk about this being a movement and not a moment. And so if this is a movement, then, then what is it going to look like six months from now? What is it going to look like a year from now versus posting something on social media? And I think that was a chance for them to sit down and decide what they wanted to get behind. And we've had several action plans since then that I'm really, really proud of and we're able to directly look in Athens, in the Athens area and even within our student athlete community and see where we've been able to help facilitate change and move things in a positive direction. So having a call to action is important, but you don't get to a call to action unless you allow your team members to put their voice in the room. Um, I think it's, the thing that we have to realize is this is their first pandemic, right? We're dealing with two pandemics at the same time, a health crisis and a human crisis. And this is their first one. And both of them came at the same time and hit them slap in the face. And so it's our job to make sure that we educate them and we support them in their decisions and, and help navigate them as they decide what it is that they wanna do. Because 15 years from now, 20 years from now, they're going to get asked, hey, you were a basketball player at the University of Georgia when, when COVID-19 came, what did you guys do as a team? What did your coach say to you? And I want them to be able to say, we did A, B, C, D. They're gonna get asked 15 years from now, 20 years from now, hey, you were a women's basketball player at the University of Georgia when George Floyd was murdered. What did you guys do? What did your coach say to you? What call to action did you guys have? How did you affect change? And I want them to be able to say, we did A, B, C, D, E. Not that we were made to do A, B, C, D, E, but this is what we decided to do. And that's how you, have a, you use your voice. That's how they have a platform and they feel empowered. Um, some of the just the messaging that we gave to our team, okay, is to make sure that we don't get caught up in having generalizations. Let's not make a, a broad general, general statement about a group of people, okay? 
um, because that has been done for far too long and it's why we're in the situation that we're in now. Let's make sure that we are considerate of the minorities that we have on our team. Okay? How do they feel in those situations? And then the other thing that we continue to talk about is just the learning curve of our allies, okay, or our, 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 our white allies. I cannot expect them to feel the same way I feel um, because I have been living this for, I'm 41, for 30 of my 41 years, I've had an understanding of what's going on. And in some of the cases of the young ladies on our team, the first time that this that racism really hit them in the face was the murder of George Floyd. And so I, I can't expect my white ally to have the same education, knowledge, or conviction about a matter that they are just trying to wrap their head around and wrap their arms around. And so it, it becomes having empathy and educating themselves and making sure that you give them the grace to ask questions without being defensive or without having your guard up. So those are the heart-to-hearts that we've had as a team, and I think that's how you navigate um, race and culture and also continue to challenge. We've got to continue to challenge um, our universities, our administration, to make sure that they see that there is a lack of representation among um, minorities in coaching positions, in athletic director positions, and even in presidents and chancellors at universities. And so as long as there's a lack of representation, there are going to be challenges. And how do we do that? How do we have more representation? I think it's sitting down with people who don't look like you and getting to know them and reaching outside of your circle to learn about people who aren't like you. Because if all I do is call people that I know, get recommendations for hires, then those people that look like me that I called are gonna give me people who look like me. So if I wanna have a diverse hiring pool, I've gotta make sure that I have people outside of my circle that I call so that it's fair. And that's all that, that I think anybody wants is to have a fair and equal shot. So I want to end with um, this video. It is our video for our theme for this year, which was show up. I think it was really important for our team and for us to not only show up as, as competitors and basketball players at the University of Georgia, but in the, in the world and the times that we live in, to show up as allies, as citizens, as voters. Um, as mothers, as daughters. And so this is a video that we put together to represent how we want to show up this year. And then as we, after we show this video, I think we'll have questions and we can dive deeper into navigating race and culture. It's time. It's time to show up and be bold. Tell a story that matters to you. Show up as a teammate, as a team, as a friend, as an ally. Show up as a sister, as a daughter, as a mother. Find your reason and show up as an energy giver, as a family, as a mentor, as a leader, again, as a leader. Whatever it takes, show up. As a winner, as a student, as a competitor, as a hustler, as a lady bulldog. All day, every day, show up. As a change maker, as an advocate, as a citizen, as a voter, as a supporter, as a supporter, as a supporter. Can you? Will you? Show up as a dreamer, yeah, as a role model, mm -hmm. show up better, show up stronger, show up faster. Show up for me, show up for you. I'm counting on you, counting on me, so show up as a coach, as an alumni, as a defender, as a passer, as a shooter, just show up as us.
So that's just the first portion of our lecture series. Hopefully you enjoyed our show up video. Um, and hopefully this was just a starting conversation to, for you guys to put some questions into the chat so we can have a deeper dive into what navigating race and culture really means in college athletics and the world that we live in, given that so many of our um, revenue generating sports are the, the student athletes that are participating and playing in those sports are minorities and the lack of representation for head coaches in those spots um, does not reflect the, the color of those student athletes. So with that, our first question is, what are your thoughts on amateurism in the NCAA? That is actually a question that I cannot answer because it is still currently um, at the Supreme Court at several different levels. There's several hearings going on right now. And so as long as those hearings are going on, we have been you know, told to um, not answer any questions about amateurism in athletics right now. So I'm sorry, I can't answer that. The second question is, why is it that there is such a large number of black athletes but not coaches? It's a lack of representation, and I think at the end of the day, it goes back to most ADs are white males, and their friends are white males. And I don't think in all cases it is malicious, but they call who they know, or they call other ADs. And if those ADs are all white, then they're going to get a pool of coaches that are white. And at the end of the day, we've got to do a better job of networking, putting ourselves in positions to be in front of those ADs so that there's more, a more diverse pool. At the same time, those athletic directors have got to look at the list in front of them and say, there is nobody black on this list or there's nobody non-white on this list. And is that how I want my program to be reflected? Is that what I want this athletic department to look like? And if it's not, they need to tear that list up and start over and reach outside of their circle and have a more diverse pool. Does that mean that you're going to hire a non-white a non person? I don't know, but at least it gets you in the room and it gives them a chance to say, you know what, I interviewed so-and-so and they actually were really, really good. And so while it wasn't the perfect fit for me, let me pass this name on when somebody else calls. And that's how it has to happen. But I think it, at a base level, it sounds really simple, but it really is that simple. You call who you know, and if everybody in that position is a white male, um, then that's what, that's what the coaching pool ends up being. What has been the biggest struggle on dealing with the murder of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor being a black woman and being a coach at a PWI? Um, the, the, there's so many ways, so many struggles. I think the biggest thing is making sure when I show up every day in front of our team that um, they know they're going to get truth from me, but also a sense of stability, confidence, and a message that, you know what, what we can do is affect change in our area. What we can do is educate ourselves and affect change in our area and how we're going to do that. And that's heavy at times because when you look at George Floyd and you look at the ruling of Breonna Taylor that just came out a few weeks ago, you get so disheartened and you get so frustrated and you get so mad. But what am I showing as a leader to my team if I show up that way to work the next day? What am I teaching them? What I want to teach them is how to use their voice and how to become advocates and allies at a young age so that hopefully they can change things for the better in the future. And I'm going to do that by being rational, by being calm, and, and telling them to put their heads together to have a call to action. Because how can I ask them to be calm and be rational and be level-headed if I am not that way when I show up every day? So it is, it is difficult. And there have been times where I've had to take some time um, before I address the team because I want to make sure that I have um, calmed down and that I am in the right headspace before I have those meetings. And so I think that's what's been challenging. I think it's also been an opportunity. It's something that we don't ignore. So after the murder of George Floyd, we had a conversation about it. How is everybody feeling? Is there anything you want to discuss? I think what you cannot do is act like it's not happening. So it's finding the balance of not only bringing it up when it happened, but checking in. Like, how's everybody feeling today? You know, where are we with this initiative that we want to do? 
You know, I know I saw something on social media. How do you feel about what was posted? How do you feel about what was posted? I think it's about having regular conversations and not just having a conversation when something pivotal happens in the news so that they know that it is something that's constantly important and not just important for a moment. How has COVID affected the day-to-day -day with college sports, particularly with the Lady Dogs? It's just a shift. It's what we have told them. It's just a shift in how we do things. I think um, in some ways it has made us a lot more cleaner. We are sanitizing everything and wiping down and in between every drill we're hand sanitizing. So in some ways it has made us aware of some things that we should have done a long time ago. In all seriousness, it has given us um, a sense of gratitude for the opportunity that we have. When we were first told to shelter in place and stay at home, it was right after the SEC tournament and our season ended abruptly. And that was hard for everybody to deal with. But we thought it was going to be a week or two and we would be back. And then when we found out that we had to stay and stay until further notice, it took a, a huge shift in terms of just our mentality. What were we going to do? This is a group of people and young ladies who strive on competition, being around each other. If you have not been around our program, I'm telling you, you're missing out. Like our culture, these ladies are amazing. We love being around each other. We love the interaction that we have and we were missing that um and i will say too i'm sure some of them did not want to be didn't expect to be home with their parents longer than the week that spring break provided so when they found out they were going to be home for longer than that a sense of panic probably sat in a little bit but it gave us a chance again to reflect on how can we be better when we come out of this what areas do we want to um create change in a positive way and how can we have a sense of gratitude for our fans, for the opportunities that we have, for basketball that has just been taken away, which allowed us to have a conversation about beyond basketball, what does this look like for you? Because we were just shown that sports can shut down. It's never happened before in, in their lifetime. So when this shuts down, what are you gonna, what is your plan B? Okay, and that is something that we, can, we constantly talk about too, so it gave us a chance to talk about that. I think the biggest thing that we have tried to do is tell them to lead with grace and humility and to be flexible and fluid. Um, I heard someone say this about a month ago, and I've been saying it ever since. We are literally building the bridge as we cross it. And so there's a, there's a lot more questions right now than answers. But I am really, really proud to say and happy to say that our young ladies have been tremendous in how they've handled every shift, every pivot, every change. We still don't have our schedule finalized, and we play our first game November 25th. We still haven't um, sold a season ticket or know if we're going to have fans, and we play on November 25th. And, and we're okay with that because we know that the best decision will be made um, with the health and safety of everyone involved. And if, that, and if that takes a little bit longer to figure out, we're willing to wait. So I'm extremely happy and proud of how we have handled it. It has been challenging at times. It definitely has not been peaches and roses, but we've been able to come back to let's look outward, not inward. Let's be grateful that we are in a space that we can play and have a season. Um, and how can we be better instead of saying this is happening for me, to me, this is happening for me, and how can we be better when we come out of it? Next question is what can we as an organization do to help student athletes? Um, you know, there's a few things I will say. My knee jerk reaction is come to games, right? But in all seriousness, I think. Our student athletes need to do a better job of matriculating themselves into um, campus life. When we get so caught up in the bubble that we are in, then, and honestly, they, their time is stretched. Like they have very little time to do anything other than be really good students and train and compete and practice. But I do want them to have a sense of all the opportunities that are available to them at the University of Georgia. So. When you see, I don't know if this is a student or a professor or who asks this question, but when you see a student athlete, if you're a professor, encourage them to get involved um, in an organization, maybe in that department that they're in for their major. If you're a student and you see a student athlete, invite them to be a part of an organization um, or a community service project or some type of philanthropy that your organization is a part of so that they can learn and meet and have more access to regular students on campus and not just know the community that is in their student athlete bubble, and then come to games and support them that way as well. Next question is, how do you help young women 
first generation athletes of color navigate through a predominantly white institution. <clears throat> you know, in most cases, they are coming from a high school program that was um, predominantly white as well. We have a lot of, um, of our black student athletes went to private school that was predominantly white. Some went to public high schools who were still maybe 60, 40. So they're used to being the minorities in situations. And I think that that is the biggest thing that has been a conversation for us in this time is we're used to being minorities, right? We're used to showing up and being the only black person in our class. I think the only space where they don't have that is when they come to basketball practice because minorities are the majority on the basketball team um, here. And, and so I think the conversation is to always do what we, what we say in the first place is to seek to understand before you're understood. Um, try to take advantage of opportunities on campus to be involved in the NCAA, NAACP, other organizations that might get you to meet more minorities outside of your student athletes. Um, and then how can, what are you doing to be inviting to other people so they can, they can get to know you? I think a big thing is wanting to, our students wanna make sure that they are known for who they are when they're not wearing the uniform because they get seen as a women's basketball player at, a football player at, a tennis player at, you know, whatever you want to fill the blank in as. And so I think as much as we can share their stories and highlight their stories of who they are as people, it helps everyone else get to know them outside of being a black athlete um, at a predominantly white school. What does it say about the Southeastern Conference to have so many black female coaches compared to other conferences? It just means more. <laughs> that is the hashtag for the SEC. That is their theme. Our theme is it just means more. And I think to, to be, let's just be real frank, to be in the Deep South, okay, which is what the SEC is, and to have six black female coaches and in the state of Mississippi, there's two black, Ole Miss and Mississippi State now both have black female coaches there. I'm from Mississippi, y'all, that is powerful. I never thought I would see that. I think it speaks to the leadership um, at the institutional level, the athletic directors, and I think it also speaks to the conference and just how we have always st set the standard for excellence and being diverse and inclusive and stretching the bar. And I, I I guess said it earlier, there's six black female coaches, but there's 10 out of, four, 10 out of the 14 coaches are female. Um, and so I, I, it's a sense of pride. I think it brings more awareness when we're in meetings and conversations to have that diverse of a pool of coaches when we're discussing things. We get a very well-rounded picture of what things should look like with white males, white females, and black females in the group. We don't have a black male, so we're still missing a category, and I would be very excited for the day that we have our first black male coach um, in the SEC. But I think it, it gives you a well-rounded picture, and that's what you want when you're making decisions. You want to be able to look around the table and see a reflection of everybody. And that is something that is not done in most cases, but in the SEC it is. And we, we have healthy conversations. We have um, challenging dialogue, and it's because there's so many different opinions that are brought to the table. And at the end of the day, that's how you get to the best decision. Next question, is being a former college athlete yourself, do you believe that student athletes get the full college experience? No, you don't. It is impossible to get the full college experience as a student athlete. Um, time just does not allow for it. And if you are getting the full college experience, you're not doing one of the two things very well that you were there to do, which is your academics and your sport. It just is, it doesn't allow for it. I do think, however, there are opportunities to be involved. I was very involved as a, as a college athlete in several things on campus, but I had to be very intentional about what that, I couldn't do everything, right? I was in a sorority. I did that after I was done playing basketball my fifth year. I could not do it while I was playing. So while I only had that experience for one year, I still had it. Um, I was a part of two different organizations. One was for the Department of Education where I was getting my major and one was with the NAACP, I didn't make every meeting. I missed most of the meetings, okay? But at least I got to know those people and when I could attend, um, I did and they knew that a student athlete cared. I think a lot of times the perception is student athletes don't care. And it's not that, it's just finding the time to do it is very difficult. 
in the commitment to it is very difficult. And a lot of student athletes are so task oriented and they're so commitment oriented that they don't want to do something if they can't give 100% to the cause or to the committee and to the organization. And so my challenge and my conversation with our student athletes has been, I think they will understand that you won't make every meeting, right? Not that you want a special accommodation or you want special treatment, but just the fact that you care enough to be a member of an organization that does not involve athletics speaks to your well-roundedness and your willingness to want to be a part of the, the campus environment. But no, there is no way a student athlete can have a regular college experience. You don't go home for Thanksgiving. You get two days for Christmas. Um, you miss Easter sometimes if you're playing in the Final Four. You don't get a spring break. It's just, you don't get to have a job. It, it is not a normal college experience. But you know that going into it. Um, and I would like to think that those sacrifices on one end the reward is so much higher um, to be able to compete and play at a high level, get a free education in most cases, and walk away with a powerful degree and opportunities that most people don't have the chance to do. How important is it for athletic associations and campuses to increase minority and female representation in administration? It is uh, so important. It is the same conversation with head coaches, just like there is a lack of representation with head coaches, there's a lack of representation in administration with um, black people and non-minorities in general. I'm the only black coach at the University of Georgia, black head coach, that is not a secret, okay? Um, that needs to change. It, it, but that's not a Georgia problem, that's a Florida problem, that's a Alabama problem. I think if you look around, there's a lot of only ones in specific athletic departments. And so, Again, those people get stretched because you're having to speak here and speak there and can you be on this committee and can you be on that committee because you are the only person of color that um, can be represented. And so I think, again, any time that you are in a program or an organization, you wanna be able to look around the room and have a diverse pool of people who represent everybody that is going to be in that room. And the way to do that is, again, it goes back to the other conversation of reaching outside of your circle when you're making hires so that you get a more diverse pool, and hopefully that leads to better opportunities. How do you balance building confidence in your athletes on the court versus preparing them for life after sport? It's like anything. The better prepared you are, the better you feel. We all know when we didn't study for a test, we didn't feel so good after when we took the test versus when you studied for the test, you feel a lot better after taking the test. Um, so confidence is built by doing the work every single day, okay? By practicing hard every day, by going in and getting up shots on your own, by being in, in top condition, taking care of your bodies. From it. Confidence is built by the little things you do every day. That's what gives you the confidence to go into competition and go into the game and feel like you have put yourself in a position in a position to win and your teammates in a position to win. What we want to do is build that same confidence when, the, when sport is over. And so we, we ask our student athletes all the time, tell me two things you want to do outside of basketball, okay, while you're at Georgia. What are two things you want to be involved in that have nothing to do with basketball, right? And some of them don't know. And if they don't know, then that gives us an opportunity to, to send them to the Georgia way and to put people in front of them, um, material in front of them, so they can start thinking about what life after basketball looks like. Some absolutely know what it is they want to do, and then that gives us a chance to start building that, to start putting a plan together um, for what that looks like. So our job is to use the four or five years that they are with us to build the next 40. Because there is not one women's basketball player who has retired from being a professional athlete that cannot, that has to, just cannot go get another job. Like they, we all have to get a second job. The money is not there in women's basketball for them to retire as a professional player and be done, right? So shame on me, shame on us, if we just use them to play basketball and we have not done anything else. And I think again, that is something that happens far too often. So our conversation and how they are confident to be prepared for life after sport is making sure they get their degree not just a degree, but a, a degree they can get a job in, and then <clears throat> working on building their brand while they are with us, having that put together, packaged up, and if they want to go have a 10-year professional career, which most of our ladies do, they want to play professionally in some capacity, we can put this on the shelf. 
And then when their professional career is over, it's there and they can come back and get it. And the Georgia Way is a program that really helps facilitate that as well. They are great liaisons for our ladies while they're playing professionally um, to make sure they're staying connected with net alumni or corporations that they may have interned with when they were student athletes um, to stay connected so that when they do transition into life after basketball, it is not so hard of a transition because it has been a constant conversation that we have been having the entire time they were playing professionally. Being a member of Delta Sigma Theta, do you see a lot of D9 members in administration, your position or your field? Yes, I do. Um, there are a lot of um, sororities represented in women's basketball, in administration. Um, we constantly try to have get at conventions or national conventions that are basketball conventions. We sometimes try to have lunch or dinner and collaborate and talk. We have group chat, group texting. Um, so yes, I do see other members of not only Delta, but other sororities in collegiate athletics. And there is um, a lot of communication and, and conversations within all of those um, sororities and groups. What is the university and the athletic department doing to grow the values of diversity and inclusion? This could take forever because we are doing so many things. So the athletic department, we, we just had a community conversation today. So one of the things that we're doing is having, I would say town hall meetings, but they're called community conversations. And once a month, there are two opportunities, once in the morning and once in the evening on the same day to log in and have a community conversation over Zoom. And we've had so many conversations about different things as it relates to diversity, inclusion, race, um, unconscious bias, white privilege, whatever you want to talk about, we've had those conversations. And sometimes we've had speakers come in and talk to us, and sometimes it's been an open forum. Today it was a small group setting okay, where we had a diversity wheel, and we were challenged to, to talk about what, who we, how we identify in this diversity wheel. And then we went into small groups and had more detailed conversations about it. So that happens once a month. We have also hired um, a consultant who comes in monthly to meet with the senior level administration, head coaches, assistant coaches, support staff, facilities, anybody you name, um, our, our teams. And he's on campus two or three times a month. And then when he's not on campus with us, we have access to him through Zoom via email. And he has actually put together a plan, um, a yearly plan for us and modules that we're going to do, a mission statement to, to really dive into looking into our athletic department and where we need to grow, what challenges we have, um, and where we've, where we've done really well. And I think it was important for the athletic department to bring somebody from the outside in to give it fresh eyes so there's no bias either way in terms of what our athletic department looks like and to tell us some hard truths about what we're doing wrong, where we can be better, and to challenge us to think beyond now. So even after we are done with the partnership with him, what we are creating now in the space for, that he has provided for us will live on for years to come in terms of the modules and the, the testing and the, and the work that we're going to do within the athletic department. So I, I'm really, really proud of um, Greg McGarity and the senior leadership team and everything they have done to give us access to put us in a space where we can get to know other people in the athletic department that we may not work with every day and to have challenging conversations so we can all learn and grow. Your program sounds designed to prioritize the development of your players. Sometimes I worry that the programs are more exploitive than supportive. What is your experience beyond your own program? Um, you're absolutely right. Uh, let me say this. My experience as a college player is exactly what I'm doing now. I was fortunate to play for someone who cared about us as a whole and not just what we can do from a basketball standpoint. I was encouraged to be involved on campus. I was encouraged to use my voice. I was encouraged to do community service um, and still be a great basketball player and graduate. Um, and so a lot of that has shaped who I am and how we run our program now. But I also know I have colleagues who, when they played, had no support. And also it was, as long as you play basketball for me, I don't really care about anything else. I don't care about your grades. Let's put you in the easiest major we can find, um, just so you can pass through and be eligible. I don't care about who you are as a person. Just show up and compete. 
I don't care about discipline because I don't want to punish you or upset you because you're my best player and I need you to play. Yes, that happens and it still happens and it infuriates me to death. And I think it's why it's so important as when prospects are making a decision on where they want to go to school, they really need to look at and have serious conversations beyond the name on the front of the jersey, um, what this coach is like, because we are doing a disservice to our student athletes. And let me just go deeper and say to our black and minority, our black and brown student athletes who come from a lot of times really bad home life situations. And if all we do is use them for their sport, then we're throwing them back into that situation. And don't tell me about them having the chance to get a free education and play professionally, because that is a small percentage of people at the end of the day who get that opportunity. And even if that's the case, is it fair for us to just, to just use them? No. And so I think it, it goes again to having representation so that we have a better understanding of the background of the kid that we are getting. It is not fair to take someone who has been in a trauma situation or just whatever that environment is, we bring them on this campus, they have access to all these things, but they still are dealing with the fact that their dad's in jail or they don't know who their dad is or their mom is working two jobs or they're the first person in their family to come to college and the pressure of having success. Like that is still a thing. So I don't care what they get while they are here. They still have things at home that they worry about. You know, do I need to figure out how with my Pell Grant check to send money home? There are so many stories that our student athletes are dealing with that we don't know about or we never hear as fans, as supporters, whatever that is. And so I think it is, the high school coach, the AAU coach, the parent, whoever is helping guide those young people, they need to ask deeper questions about, well, what are you doing to prepare my young daughter, my young son, my grandson, my niece, my nephew for life after sport? You know, how do I know? Show me the things you've done with your current player. Show me their graduation rates. Show me the ones who don't make it to the NFL, who don't make it to the NBA. What are they doing right now? What jobs have you helped secure for them? And what have you done to put them in a position to be successful for life? You know, show me the diversity of the people in your support program. So I think those are all questions that need to be asked because unfortunately, a lot of programs are still doing exactly what you said, which is exploiting um, student athletes. And most of those student athletes are black and brown. What advice would you give to an athlete who's the only person of color on their team, feeling like a token, making their voice heard? Um, so I would say, number one, if you are playing a sport where you are the only person of color on your team, you probably have dealt with this for a while because most of those sports are looked that way in high school, right? And so they end up that way in college. I would say that you need to make sure you have um, an assistant coach or a head coach that you can talk to to say, this is how I'm feeling. I wanna make sure that you know my voice is in the room or this is how I'm being treated. I think the bigger thing is to make sure that their coaches and their support staff are aware that they are my, that those that student athlete is a minority in that situation, and what are we doing? Are we doing everything we can to make them comfortable? Are we making sure that none of their teammates are, you know, having an unconscious bias or using terms or using words or slurs or being you know insensitive to this person that is the only minority in that situation because even though you might be used to it even though it's something that could seem normal it's still hard it's still difficult and in the time of covid it's even more difficult because it makes it um, we can't go socialize like we used to so whereas this student athlete maybe would have had an outlet at training table or in study hall that is closed right now so when are they having access to someone who looks like them and i think it's it's our job as coaches to provide that. And for that student athlete, I would say, use your voice and go and advocate for yourself. And if that doesn't help, reach out to someone in administration, call me, you know, do some things to make sure that you have an advocate and an ally to support you and speak for you. If you have tried to use your voice and it hasn't worked, or if you're at a point where you're not ready to use your voice, there are people on campus, Victor Wilson, I'll put him on the spot too. There are people on campus that can help you with that and within the athletic department. So that is all the questions I think that we have. 
I've enjoyed this so much and hopefully you did too. And I think this is an ongoing conversation. The one thing I would say is nothing we talked about is gonna change overnight. It's about educating yourself, having on your mind so that when you're presented with opportunities and you're presented with um, moments to create change, to have a more diverse pool, to bring diversity to a situation, hopefully this, this lecture tonight has helped you put that on the front of your mind. So thank you.